Good morning and welcome to worship at Martin Luther. We're glad that you're here today to gather around God's word and sacrament. This morning our worship will follow the theme that the church is meant for all people. That uh, service will be, or that'll be the focus of our service. That's uh, printed out for you in your worship folder. Uh, it'll also be projected for you on the screen. We'll begin with our opening hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West. We'll sing the first two stanzas of that hymn, and I invite you to stand for the second of those stanzas. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift of grace that we come into your presence and offer true and faithful service. Grant that our worship on earth may always be pleasing to you, and in the life to come, give us the fulfillment of what you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Today's first lesson is recorded for us in Joshua chapter 2. This lesson serves as an example of how the church is meant for all people. Because in the person of Rahab, we see someone who was not one of the Israelites, someone who was a Gentile, and on top of that, was someone who had lived a sinful life. But regardless of her ethnicity or anything she had done in the past, God loved her and brought her into the church. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family, because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, Go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless, when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers, and all your family into your house. If any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away, and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. This is the word of the Lord. Today's second lesson is recorded in Romans chapter 11. Here, too, we see the Apostle Paul as an example of how the church is meant for all people. The Apostle Paul himself was a Jew, but he was the missionary to the Gentiles. And here he speaks of how he longs for both Jews and Gentiles to be saved and to become a part of the church, which is meant for all people. I'm talking to you, Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Just as you, who were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient, in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel is recorded in Matthew chapter 15 and will serve as the basis for today's sermon. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, 
It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she replied. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn of the day that's selected stanzas from uh, hymn 413, When in the Hour of Utmost Need. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters, beloved by our Lord Jesus. Shortly after walking on water, the event that we took a closer look at last week, Jesus, leaving that place, withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Well, where is that, and what brought Jesus here, and why? Is he there? That means Jesus would have traveled about 15 to anywhere from maybe 30 miles uh, north and west of the Sea of Galilee, which is where he had been, which puts him at the very edge of the land of Israel. He withdrew there, it says. But don't think that this is some sort of vacation for Jesus. Mark records that Jesus entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. This escape wasn't just for his own sake, although I'm sure Jesus was exhausted because of the hectic pace of his ministry over the past few days. 
But this was mostly for his disciples. Think of the events that they had just seen. Within a matter of days, they had seen numerous miracles like feeding the 5,000, walking on the water, calming a storm. And then they had seen a few heated discussions, debates between Jesus and the Pharisees and the followers who had been first flocking to Jesus, even wanting to make him a king, were now abandoning him in great numbers. It's a lot to take in. It's a lot to process. And Jesus knew that he needed to take some time alone with them and teach them a few things about what was going on. And yet, word got out. His reputation as a teacher and healer got there ahead of him. And a woman who was in desperate need comes to find Jesus. Mark is even a bit more descriptive about this in his account when he says, As soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. Matthew adds that the girl was suffering terribly from demon possession. And she calls out to Jesus, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. Even at this farthest corner of Israel, this Gentile woman calls Jesus by a name reserved for the Messiah. Somewhere, somehow, she had learned of God's promises because she identified Jesus as that Savior that God had promised to send. And she says to him, have mercy on me. Because her daughter's pain had also become her pain. And these words are a desperate cry for help. Look at my pitiful state, she's saying. See how truly wretched I am. Be moved by compassion and help me. And she believed that Jesus... God's Savior to the world could and would help her. I mean, why else would he be there at right at this time? And who could disagree with that? But what happens next? She calls out for help. But Jesus did not answer a word. What? What? What is going on here? I mean, that's not like Jesus at all. But as God's Messiah, he was bound to follow God's plan, and it was not yet time for her or her people in that plan. Jesus' ministry was to be focused on the Jews, the chosen people of God from the Old Testament. Scripture plainly says that salvation would be from the Jews and then it would be first for the Jews. And that would have to happen first before the focus would then shift to sharing that message to the, with the Gentiles. Jesus did not come to this far off place to be a missionary. He came here to teach his disciples about the true purpose of his ministry and what that would mean for him and also what that would mean for them as they went forward together following God's plan. And it became painfully obvious that the disciples were not understanding this yet. His disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. And you can imagine why. They would understand, right? Or you could understand, excuse me, why they would say something like this, right? Picture it. This woman comes up and has continued to call out after Jesus. And she's making a scene. And the way this is being described is that the disciples are repeatedly coming up to Jesus and asking him to do something. And don't just think that they're saying something like, would you just ditch this nuisance already? 
It's more like, look, Jesus, will you just help her already? We know you're going to help her. You always do. So just get it over with already so we won't be bothered anymore. Not exactly coming from a heart of love, is it? Not exactly understanding who Jesus is or why he is there. And so Jesus uses this also as a teaching moment. He needs to instruct them first. And so he responds, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. But notice that these words are not directed to that woman. This was to be a lesson for the disciples. Jesus must follow the Father's plan. That is why he is there. And his power was for completing the mission that the Father had sent him to fulfill. His power was not for their convenience, not just so that he could keep them from being bothered. It was not yet time for him to act for her or for that message to reach the Gentile peoples, but it was coming soon. But Israel right now was and still remained lost, and so Jesus had to focus first on them. And yet the woman persists. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. Now, on hands and knees, she keeps begging, literally begging for Jesus' help. And Jesus' next words must have seemed like a dagger to her heart. Because how... Can you understand these words in any other way than outright rejection? It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. But notice again, those words are not directed to this woman. Jesus said what he said here as a general proverb, and it was a general proverb that captured the attitude of many in Israel in how they looked at the Gentiles, people like this woman who was kneeling in front of him. God's plan of salvation, the blessings of Jesus' ministry were to be first for the Jews. The Gentiles, though, would have their turn, but it wasn't quite yet. But first, the children at the table must have their chance, and And many in Israel would have said it's really only the children at the table that deserve anything from the Lord. But even here, she finds hope and an opportunity. She understands what Jesus is saying, even if the disciples did not. She recognizes that Israel was to have the first place in God's plan. And she calls them, in her response to Jesus, rightfully, the masters. But she recognizes that she does have a place in that plan, and she submits to God's will for that. She understands that things must go according to his will. It's not right for the family pet to jump up onto the chair and start eating off the table. But those pets, they're going to be right there with the children when the meal is served. And anything that hits the ground belongs to the hound, right? Sometimes even those animals are given a treat directly from the hand of the people at the table. But they sit there around the table knowing that the crumbs are going to fall. And what she is saying here is that she will gladly wait there beside the table. And she believes that even the smallest crumb from Jesus will be more than enough to help her in her time of need. And that was all that she was asking for. Yes, Lord, you're right in what you say. 
but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And now Jesus turns and speaks directly to her. Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. He praises her faith. A word of praise that Jesus offers only one other time in the Bible. And her daughter was healed at that very moment. Before we continue, we should talk maybe a little bit about faith. Last week, we heard about Peter and how he was weak. He had little faith. And now we hear of her great faith. And this idea of a faith that is strong or weak, great or small, can cause confusion. When we're talking about a strong faith or a weak faith, what are we not talking about? We are not talking about saving faith. That is, is this person going to go to heaven or not? Both Peter and this woman knew that Jesus was their Savior. And saving faith is never something that is strong or weak. It's something that is there or it isn't. And this is what saving faith is. Do I know, do I believe that Jesus is the Savior and that he is the Savior for me? Yes, I believe that. That means you have saving faith and you will go to heaven when you die. So how then can the Bible talk about faith being strong or weak? Strength of faith has to do with a specific promise from God, like the healing of a child or being able to walk on the surface of the water. This woman never wavered in her confidence toward Jesus and his healing of her daughter. Peter on the surface of that water, however, wavered in his confidence toward Jesus. And weakness of faith can come from any number of different things. It can come from a lack of knowledge about what God's word says or a lack of understanding about one of his promises and how it applies in my particular situation. But it can also come from the opposition that we face from trials or circumstances in life I mean, as Peter saw those waves crashing around him and because of the wind and, the, and, and everything that was going on in that storm, that caused him to waver in his confidence toward Jesus. But even if you suffer from a moment of weakness, you would still have saving faith in knowing that Jesus is your Savior. And if Peter would have died in that moment, of weakness, if he would have sunk to the bottom of the sea, he would have gone to heaven. Just because you struggle in a, at, at one point because of a weakness of faith or, or struggling with a promise or, or not quite understanding a point of teaching, just because you struggle here or there on occasion, that doesn't mean that you are no longer a child of God. So what does this mean then for us? This woman here knew that just a crumb from Jesus would be more than enough for her. We should recognize that too and be content with that. And yet how often doesn't Jesus give us so much more? Yes, salvation was from the Jews and it was first for the Jews, but God's love did not end with them. In some ways, we can find ourselves in a situation very much like this woman here. We too are in desperate need. She cried out, Lord, have mercy on me. But how familiar are those words? Moments ago, we sang those very same words as we confessed our sins. Because we recognize that we were born in sin. 
And we commit each day sins in thought and word and action. Sins of greed and laziness. Sins of a lack of trust or lack of persistence in prayer. Sins of looking down on other people. Sins that demand me first, Jesus. Right now, Jesus. Lord, have mercy on us. Be moved by our wretchedness. Help us because we cannot help ourselves because of this sin. We must throw ourselves upon the mercy of our God. We need the Savior that he has sent. And now our time has come. Jesus has completed his mission. It is finished, he said. He lived that perfect life that God commanded. He died that sacrificial death to pay for sin as God demanded him to do. And he has removed every single one of those sins, including those sins of weakness of faith and wavering in our trust of his promises. And his work course is not just for Israel anymore nor really was it ever Jesus came to be the savior of all people for the Jews for this Gentile woman for you and me for all nations for all people you know the greatness of God's love and you know that it is for all people you have seen it play out in Jesus So be bold in speaking the good news of what you know of Jesus and the opportunities that he gives you to share that wonderful news with others. You can do that also by being generous in your support of that work of sharing the message of Jesus, which certainly happens right here, but happens also throughout our church body in so many different ways. And all the while, the crumbs continue to fall. And each one is more than enough. We could live on even the smallest one for all eternity, and yet Jesus says for his people, to those who look to him and know that he is their Savior, he has prepared a wedding banquet, a feast to enjoy for all eternity. And what a privilege. We get to share the invitations to that feast. May we be bold in doing so. peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. This time, again, uh, we will not be passing the offering plates as we uh, usually would, but uh, there is a plate there in the back. You can drop your uh, envelope there, uh, your offering there, if you wish, um, on your way out. And uh, we will continue at this point then with singing our offering hymn. Uh, you'll, we will sing the posted stanzas of hymn 494, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
Lord and Savior. You have purchased us to be your own for all eternity. You have given purpose to our time in this life by making us your witnesses to lost sinners. We thank you for the high privilege of working with you to gather your elect into your kingdom. As you looked with compassion on the lost sheep of Israel, grant that your Holy Spirit may move us to look with compassion on the lost of our day. Fill us with zeal to do all that we can to bring them the precious gospel so that they too may experience the joy of being your disciples. Enable us to be faithful witnesses to all those whose lives we touch, whether it be in the privacy of our homes or in our communities. We thank you for missionaries and their families who are willing to live and work in distant lands. Keep them from harm of body and soul, and give them joy in their difficult assignments. Above all, we ask you to bring those who hear the word to repentance and faith. Look with compassion on all people, especially those who are suffering, and give help and relief to all who are in need. Although we have failed you again and again, we have learned to know you as a patient and merciful God. We ask you, therefore, to forgive us for the many times we have failed to share the message of your love with those who need it most. Renew us, restore us, and use us to proclaim your love by word and deed to all people near and far. May many more rejoice with us, and we with them, when together we stand before your throne of glory. We ask all this in your name, as we join together to pray as you have taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will strengthen and keep you in the true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endures forever. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for a closing hymn. Good morning. Good morning. Once again, welcome to Martin Luther. We're glad that you're here today. We'd invite you to join us for worship again soon. As far as announcements go, I'd encourage you to take a look at those that are printed for you in the weekly news. I will be gearing up with uh, Bible class and Sunday school coming up soon here. Um, so uh, pay attention to those announcements that are printed for you there, uh, both today and in the weeks to come. As you leave here today, uh, you won't be ushered out, um, so you can go ahead and leave whenever you're ready. I'd uh, encourage you to keep a, a little bit of distance as you, as you visit with one another. Certainly, if you want to step outside into the fresh air, uh, that's not a bad idea. It's a, it's a beautiful day out there, so we can certainly enjoy that. As pastors, we won't be greeting you uh, in the back like we normally would, uh, but we will be up front here if anyone wants to talk. With that, I wish you a blessed week in the Lord.